Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight in honor of Beatrice Wood's birthday. My name is Rachel Denniston, and I'll be assisting and moderating this event. Just so you know, this event is being recorded and will be made available on YouTube afterwards. Um, tonight will be an evening of storytelling and fun. We will hear from a number of exciting speakers and those closest to Beatrice, including family, friends, art historians, gallerists, and more. Please save your questions for the end when we'll be opening it up for a Q&A. Without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Kevin Wallace, director of the Beatrice Wood Center for the Arts. And here I am. <laughs> um, I, I wanna welcome everybody to Beatrice's birthday party. I'm excited we managed to pull together a great group of individuals from her life and they're gonna share stories and some insights into her life and career. Um, some of these people haven't seen each other for two decades, so it's, it's like a family reunion. It's, it, it's really quite wonderful. Just briefly, as you all probably know, we um, opened up the Beatrice Woods Center for the Arts in Beatrice Woods Home and Studio in 2005. Uh, we have a permanent collection of her work, her folk art collection, photos, didactic panels, um, everything to share her story and who she is. And as we're an activity of an uh, educational nonprofit, we also do exhibitions of contemporary artwork, um, workshops, performances, all sorts of things. Unfortunately, we are currently closed along with California museums and we're not doing any, any of those things, um, but we're hoping to um, be able to reopen soon and then probably resume our regular programming where we put big groups of people together in a room, maybe in the fall. I also just wanna remind everybody that we are completely supported by donations, grants, and memberships. So if you are not a member, I'm hoping you will join and be part of our community. Um, the, the, because the fact of the matter is, um, there's no guarantee that the, um, the Beatrice Woods home and studio will be Beatrice Woods home and studio forever, but we're doing everything we can to keep that going. So um, that's, I'm gonna not say a lot because I'm looking forward to this presentation. So. I'll be here partying with you all and um, I'll be back to answer questions or I might pop in here and there as needed. So thank you all so much for being here. Thanks, Kevin. Um, next up, we'll hear from Stephen and Helene Heiler. Stephen is an art historian, cultural anthropologist and his wife, Helene, is a storyteller and artist. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I am fortunate to, uh, I'm 69 um, and more, and uh, have never not known Beatrice Wood. Uh, I was born and raised about two to 300 yards from her house. Uh, I remember her from very young childhood. Uh, I'm sure she doesn't remember or didn't remember me much from those years. Um, she was, it was before India, before she'd gone to India and uh, she wore skirts and, um, uh, big hats and uh, peasant blouses, etc. Uh, and uh, I began working for her when I, in 1970, uh, when I had come back from my first year in college uh, and worked in her studio in her garden and uh, helped her wedge clay and uh, prepare some of the glazes. And uh, I learned, I sat at her feet in absolute total Thrall. I was completely besotted with her. Uh, I am, I think several of us here tonight are the young men of Young Men in Chocolates. Um, I certainly was. Uh, Beatrice called me her gigolo proudly when we would go into town to shop. Uh, she would introduce me as her gigolo and <laughs> took great uh, joy in watching how shocked uh, the older women that she would introduce me to would, uh, would be. Um, the ch chocolate part, I, I'm perhaps the only one that has a really uh, close um, claim to that because my grandfather was a famous chocolate maker and Beatrice actually flirted with my grandfather, much to my grandmother's dismay long before I was born. Um, and so it kind of does go back. Uh, then Beatrice introduced me to India and I have spent the last 49 years working in India through Beatrice's introductions. And that has been extraordinary. My life has been very good, but because of Beatrice, she was my major mentor. Uh, I introduced her to Helene the next year. Um, Helene, uh, who's also called Hi, is going to speak for a couple of minutes about their relationship and I'll come back in. Well, I was fortunate enough to, to meet Beatrice and we became very good friends. 
and she very much enjoyed the fantasy that she and Steve and I were a menage a trois and, and told everybody this. And when we got married, uh, she sent us two beautiful lusterware goblets and my mother and I were unpacking the wedding presents and she was putting stickers on them to say who had given us what. And she turned one of these goblets over to put a sticker on it and gasped and in a, with a Sharpie inside one of the goblets on the, on the raw clay part, uh, she had written, what a shame you married the wrong girl. <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious and my mother was totally scandalized. But we had, we had several decades of dear friendship and she visited us in Europe and, and uh, she, she was an extraordinary person and I feel very blessed to have known her. Um, thank you. And for me, uh, just to say that um, I traveled with uh, Beatrice uh, in India. Um, she introduced me to people that were extraordinary, including Lalan Singh, who is uh, on and will speak to us in a while, and his father I met when I was just 20. Uh, also, I am um, the one other comment that I would like to say. There's so many things that one could say about her. Uh, People know about her outlandishness. They know about her extraordinary wit. They know about um, her flamboyance. But Beatrice was to me one of the wisest human beings I've ever been privileged to meet. Her insights, her deep thinking, her philosophies, her thoughts, her extraordinary honesty, uh, her, her absolute determination to be honest in all that she did uh, conveyed to me concepts and ethics with which I could only begin to try to live up to, but have uh, guided me my entire life. And for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you. And she was the maid of dishonor at our wedding. She was. <laughs> her, her term. Her term, yeah. I love that so much. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, next, I'm excited to introduce Jeff and Robert Wood, Beatrice Wood's grandnephews. Hola. How's everybody? Hello. Good evening. So, you know, Beatrice has always been part of our lives. Um, when we were young and my parents would take us up to meet Aunt Beatrice, the eccentric person of the family, um, you know, we would, uh, you know, I was always so um, amazed that Beatrice was so open in who she was to all of us and brought us in there. But um, we would always think of this eccentric woman that was there. And, uh, you know, when we were a kid, you're running around, you don't really understand the whole concept of it. But I could tell you that uh, the many hours I spent looking at her pottery in her little tiny studio in McAndrews Road, and just looking at the wonderful glazes and the artwork that she had, my mom would say, oh, no, don't touch, don't touch, you might break it. And she goes, no, you can touch anything, I'll just make a new one, <laughs> which was so beto. Um, and uh, it was, uh, here we are, you know, going up as a little family, and so she would have us for lunch. Well, we weren't vegetarians, and we thought that some of that food was sort of the weirdest shit we've ever seen in our lives. <laughs> she had the best ice cream. I mean, there was always ice cream for dessert. Right. My dad bought her first uh, ice cream freezer. I remember that. And uh, she loved to make ice cream. But she would serve us like pumpernickel bread with jack cheese. And that would be lunch. <laughs> and we'd go right straight down to the first burger joint after that anyway. Um, I've had many opportunities to stay with Beto and be part of her life. And it was always a pleasure to be in her, um, her energy. And um, there's so many opportunities that uh, I have seen. I'm trying to uh, come up with some of the uh, honesty that she was the most honest person I've ever met. One time we were a little late and that was because my spouse could never be on time. And we got the lecture from hell in the most eloquent way you've ever had it. <laughs> and the clock and I have things to do and you would don't, we don't, um, yeah. Um, she was right there. So we were having a little, um, conversation in her um, studio one day and this young boy comes in with his art he wants to share this beautiful art with Vito 
And so she's going through and looking at it. Mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. And she you might need to do something with this. She looks at him and she said, you know, you got some work you need to do. But if you think that you're going to use my name to go somewhere in this world, it's not going to happen. And this poor kid was just so forlorn. Oh, my God. Um, and so he gathered up his stuff. And as he was walking out, of course, what does she say? Wow, he's got a great butt. <laughs> that was so Beto. That was just so her. Another time when I was staying with Beto, when she was around 103, um, she usually didn't come out till about 11 o'clock, but I was having coffee in the kitchen and she shows up in her nightie. Would you like some French pancakes? I'm like, well, hell yeah, if you're going to cook them, of course I do. I thought she was going to burn the house down and we got to sit together and have these homemade French pancakes and talk about when she was in France. That's what she lived on all her life and stuff. Because um, she didn't have any money, of course, so she would uh, do that. No recipe, she just threw this stuff together, fried it up, and it was great. Um, it was just always amazing when you had dinner with Beto, she would throw little things at you and little words and stuff that she would kind of take you off guard a little bit. But always on your little name card, there was some sort of a message there that was so poignant. And maybe you didn't get it at first, but later on, when you look back at it, she was just such a unique person and uh, it was a pleasure to be with her. I was happy to be with her at her 100th birthday party celebration and when she got the Living Treasure Award from the governor of California and to be right there with her when she uh, got up and did her speech and uh, she came back and sat down at the table next to me and she wasn't really wild about the art that she got as the prize for what they gave her um, for the, the uh, award. And I never heard her say this before. And she said that, she, I don't really like this. Well, who comes over and visits and sits right next to her was um, the person who created this statuary for her. And that was Angelica Houston's husband, handsome man. And when I got done, I said, karma is so good, isn't it? <laughs> it got you there. So, um, you know, um, the last time I saw Beto was on her 105th birthday. I got to have a little private time with Beto. And uh, as usual, she was just herself. And there were two postcards on the wall of naked men's butts with their heads turning backwards. And she said, well, which one do you think has the best butt? And I went over and I looked at all these little men's butts in those postcards. And I said, you know, Beto, they all have good butts and we didn't ever have one. So every one of them has the best butt. And that was the last time I spent time with Beto. That's how I ended it with a kiss and walked away. And uh, I was very lucky to be part of her life and to have her um, inspiration. Jeff? Well, you know, my memories of Beto was visiting her as a child and, and just being, you know, there's this, there's this eccentric woman. We get the lecture all the way down the hill that you couldn't touch anything, couldn't talk, you had to be nice. Um, and then we would sit with Beto for a while and then go outside and, and look at her koi pond and chase lizards on the wall. And later on in life, got too busy for me, so I rarely got to go out and, and visit her. I think the last time I visited her was in the mid-80s sometime. So. It is cool, though, that I can say, ah, did you see the movie Titanic? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I have to say one more thing. The day that Beto passed, um, I got a call that she went peacefully, and that night when I got in my car and turned on the key, the Titanic song came on. That uh, just stopped me in my tracks immediately. And I was like, this is karma. Okay, come on, really? And it was just so instantly, it just I turned it on and it started singing. And I was like, she's there. She was part of it. Um, Lalan Singh was a friend of Beatrice Wood and son of R.P. Singh, who served as Beatrice's business manager um, for quite some time. So Lalan, if you'd love, if you would like to share. It, it was almost 50 years ago. In 1971, when I met Beatrice in Calcutta, she came came for dinner at, at my our, our house, and uh, there was one mystery guest supposed to be there. Beatrice was there. She was sitting 
and we were chit chatting, you know, just uh, and mystery guest shows up, and that was a Stephen Heiler <laughs> <laughs> with, with full beard, purta pajama, sandals, and carrying a long shoulder bag, cloth bag. Looked perfect Indian artist, handsome Indian young artist. As he saw Beatrice, he rushed there and goes and kissed kissed her toe. <laughs> and I was I was as an onlooker. I was just I I said that this lady, sitting in sari, clad in sari, is must be very very important. She is very <laughs> special. She was. And that that image from that point on, it has stayed with me. She had been very special to me. And uh, she treated me like her own family and my family treated her same way. And uh, <clears throat> through her, I met so many wonderful people here. When I came to America, uh, of course, my dad was associated with her uh, through American uh, uh, Foreign Service. And uh, finally, I came, came to America in 1972, and I stayed with her at McAndrew Road, uh, Mrs. Helen, Helen Merriam and Bob Bryan and my dad, they came to pick me up from LAX, drove me in her beautiful Lincoln Continental car that was, that was quite a ride. And uh, Beto was uh, standing outside in her yard with uh, all the pottery, reasonable, unreasonable written, those, those, those uh, statues. Uh, uh, Steve may, may remember all that. Course. With uh, with cactus and lo big, big huge cactus and all that, so <clears throat> so I I went in her. Uh, she said, "This is your room. This is the guest room." And uh, I just uh, I I was I was just go go to freshen myself, and then I started looking around, and I found a copy of Playboy. <laughs> that that created such a such a commotion. <laughs> Fury started, you know. My dad, my dad coming with you know he had very old traditional values and all that. So they started arguing, and she said that I put it because I I, I saved lunch a couple of dollars because <laughs> if I did not put it, he would have gone and bought it anyway. <laughs> So, so that, that, that was my first introduction with her. Then I was in Calcutta. I was assigned as an unpaid a guide for her because my dad was busy with his work and all that. So wherever she went, she charmed people, just simply charmed everybody. And uh, she had to send one parcel and uh, her her hotel where she was uh, staying that uh, from from the post office it was about a couple of blocks and uh, i i said that uh, do do you want me to call a cab or she said no no let's let, let's go walk and we started walking it was very noisy lot of traffic and all that and, and we kept on walking and uh, all on a sudden she will start running. So I had to run with her. Then she will stop, then run again. And then, then she started, it, it was big, big post office, big building and lots of stairs, many, many stairs like uh, Capitol Hill here, uh, like, like our Capitol in Washington. And uh, she started climbing those stairs I was amazed that how, how she was managing that. So much energy she had. Then, then we, I, as we go in the lobby, I mean, in, in, inside. She was 79 at that time. 79 at that time, yes. 
and uh, and you know uh, in the lobby there, there there was long line and one one man sitting at the window frowny face totally you know like he he had no uh, no life absolutely you know very uh, as if he did not like his job and all that and so many people are standing and and he noticed Beatrice and ask ask her to come like like come like this and she she walked to to the window everybody is looking and you know she she did not have to stand in line and her job was done just like that <laughs> and, and he looked happy after that after after serving her that was one incident there is second one which was even more interesting according to me that uh, she had to send some some artifacts through air so i had to take her to air india cargo office we were we were waiting for someone to help us you know and uh, the head person you know in charge of that cargo office he he noticed her and called us in in his office rings the bell gets the someone to come and bring all the form and everything offers us cold drink and then finally give, gives us a ride in his car he he drove her to her her hotel and uh, then betty said that isn't he a dream he he, he was my dream boat and <laughs> And of course, you know, later on I found out that Bob Barker, Price is Right, and Ted Koppel, they were dream boats too. <laughs> and I'm sure some, some of you are dream boats too. And, and she will not miss those programs, you know, every, every night, you know, if, it used to come in the evening and she used to watch that. Next, we will hear from art historian and curator, Francis Nauman. Hi, um, I'm timing myself, so I won't exceed uh, 10 minutes. Uh, the, uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, is actually precisely what we're all doing here tonight. Uh, it has to do with Beatrice's legacy, uh, which very much affects me on a daily basis. Um, I used to take, say to people, not a day goes by when I don't think of Beatrice. In an actual truth, that's exactly what happens. I thought, well, maybe I'd go a few days and forget, but I couldn't, and I can't, because her work surrounds me. I see it every day. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but first I wanted to actually publicly thank Beatrice for something that I've never, of course, had a chance to do. I wrote a sort of autobiography a few years ago that was published by a press in California. Uh, when the editor of the press saw the manuscript, uh, she explained to me that she would never even have considered publishing it if I didn't include the chapter on Beatrice, which she thought was a highlight of the book. Um, and I must confess, even going back and rereading it, it is really where my heart was. Uh, the other people that I wrote about were more about their intellect than anything else. But Beatrice spoke to my heart from the second I met her. And in a funny way, she still continues to do that. Uh, I usually begin talks about Beatrice's legacy by quoting, of all people, Anthony Quinn uh, in his obituary that appeared in the New York Times. He said that you are never forgotten until the people who knew you die. It was a rather self-serving thing for someone like Anthony Quinn to say because, hell, he had been in lots of films, so there are a lot of people who knew him. But the interesting thing is I once said that in a gathering and my assistant at the gallery who was then only around 30 years old at the end said, who is Anthony Quinn? <laughs> Which I thought, Whoa, uh, and then I realized that the fame that everyone wants, Beatrice talked about this a lot. She, she thought fame was so fleeting, no one should ever spend the time trying to want it. Of course, here she is in Southern California where there's such an emphasis on Hollywood stars but she knew something about those Hollywood stars that maybe they themselves were unaware of, that fame for them is really very fleeting. It doesn't last very long. 
it, it's barely the lifetime of their children, um, if, if that, depending on how much fame they attained even in their lifetime. But artists never seem to be forgotten if they're good. Uh, like you are never gonna forget the name Michelangelo. It doesn't matter how many people knew him after his death. That name's never going to go away. And the reason is, is because he continues to live on. He lives on in museums. And Beatrice lives on in my house uh, because I have what I think is one of the largest collections of her work because I kept buying it after her death. Whenever anything came up at auction, I was the one buying it. Uh, and I have a kitchen, for example, that I just recently redesigned, and I designed it in such a way that I would be surrounded by her pottery, by large-scale vessels. But when you are literally surrounded by the work of a person, you don't forget them. And Beatrice once said, that actually, the very first day that I met Beatrice in 1976, she was telling me various events of her life, and she dropped a name as if I should have understood and known who the person was. It was Helen Freeman, her good friend for many years. And I said, who, wait, wait, I'm sorry, stop. Can you tell me who Helen Freeman is? And she said, and I remember her response. She just looked at me and she said, what is fame? And I said, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean, what is fame? She said, well, Helen Freeman was the most famous person I ever knew. Well, indeed, Helen Freeman was very famous in her lifetime in New York in the teens because she starred in many Broadway plays. What Beatrice probably didn't even know is that she had a secret love affair with Mitchell Kennerly, a very rich man at the time who was married. But anyway, she went off to California. Uh, she married a Hollywood uh, screenwriter of Westerns and her name changed to Helen Freeman Coral. Uh, but no one remembered who she was because when she did go to Hollywood and tried to get into movies, her voice was too high pitched and the talkies wouldn't accept her. So Beatrice was basically saying to me, what's the point of fame? And I remember, and I remember this very vividly that she once, had, there was an article about to be published on her in Smithsonian Magazine. And I was very anxious to tell her all about it because this would put her on the map. And I remember when I told her, she looked pleased, but then not as excited as I was. And I said, why aren't, why does, why aren't you more pleased by this information? She said, because there are two types of fame. And I said, what? And she goes, there are two types of fame. There's one that makes you famous instantaneously. And then there's the one more enduring one that's part of the art world. I, I didn't at the time understand exactly what she said, but I, I will very clearly remember that once we were walking across Hollywood Boulevard, uh, and this was in the 90s, she had just appeared on the Today Show. Um, a woman recognized her, grabbed her by her sari and started dragging her across the road. I remember getting so angry over this and Beatrice kept trying to calm me down and said, no, no, she just wants, she just wants uh, something, she wants my autograph. And that's exactly what the woman did. She had a little pad with her and Beatrice had to sign in it. And then when the woman left, she turned around to me and said, you see, what I mean by fame. Uh, so I really understood then and there what she meant. Uh, the thing is that I suppose uh, in the end, Beatrice wanted her legacy to be her works of art. Uh, and in fact, one of them and right now hangs in the Museum of Modern Art. It's her poster for her 1917 independence exhibition. And actually, I have an example of it right up there on the wall. I don't know if you can see behind me. It's right there, up there at the top. No, uh, I, I had been given by Beatrice five examples of that poster. And I gave four of them away and kept that one and intend to keep it for the rest of my life. But interestingly enough, the poster that's hanging right now in the Museum of Modern Art, if you go up to it, you'll see that the caption does not read that it's a gift from me. What is, I almost hate to report this, but in the 1980s, when I gave it, the museum was undergoing a kind of renovation and they lost the poster. They actually lost it, but they paid a great deal of money to acquire another example, the one that they now do have on display in the museum. So maybe you can say works of art are a lasting permanent 
legacy, but not when you lose them. Uh, and I had a horrible tragedy happen to me once in the early 1990s. My entire Beatrice Wood collection was kept in a large showcase of three shells made of glass, but unfortunately, the pins that held the glass in place were made of plastic. And if you put a great deal of pressure against plastic over a period of time, it collapsed. And my entire shelf, three shelves of glass collapsed on top of one another and almost totally destroyed my entire collection of works by Beatrice Wood, all the pottery works. I paid a great deal of money to have some of them restored. I gave them to museums. Uh, but I realized that the works that Beatrice made, pottery is by its very nature, very fragile and you have to take good care of it. Uh, and in a funny way, it's like your children. I, I often think of the parallels between pottery and human beings. I did write about that once with Beatrice because after all, a vessel is composed of a mouth at the top. It has shoulders on the vase. It has handles. It has feet. Uh, it has a body. It, it's almost like a human being. And Beatrice's vessels are, of course, just like her. They're iridescent glazes, like the great and beautiful lustrous jewelry that she wore all the time. So they are literally a reflection of her. Uh, and it's for that reason that I especially enjoy seeing them every day because they're literal reminders of who she was and who she meant to me. Thank you so much, Francis. That was lovely. Um, so next up, we have Gail Childress. She's one of the founding members of Ojai Studio Artists. Forgive me if I have to read some of this stuff, but th it sort of capitalized everything here. Um, when I first moved to Ojai in the 70s, the mid 70s, the art scene was either asleep, dormant, or hibernating. It wasn't until four years later in the 80s, the beginning of the 80s, um, there was a huge awakening of the, of the art scene here in Ojai. I mean, it was like the arts were on fire and Beatrice Wood was there in the very beginning to help jumpstart all of this. And this is what, how it happened, I think. It all started with the Ojai Art Center and it was uh, resurrecting then a defunct art branch. And for those that don't know the Art Center, it's a nonprofit, self-supported entity with various branches of the arts, like the theater branch, music, dance, fine arts. And each of the branches were to contribute to um, financially to the art center to keep the doors open. So we now have a, a new art branch. It, it was um, the, the first fundraiser of the newly uh, revised art branch. One of the members of the this branch was Chris Gray, and she had a son that was working in Hollywood for, for movie sets, uh, lighting and, and uh, set design. He brought his crew up to, oh, I, I jumped the thing. The, the first fundraiser was going to be a Beaux-Arts ball for raise funds for the art center. So we've got this Hollywood guy who decorated with a set design and to do the ball. And Beatrice Wood was, invited to be the queen of the ball. And of course, <laughs> she said yes to our surprise. And I'm gonna come back to this particular moment for a personal memory, if I may. So the next two years at the art center, the fundraisers from the art branch were using um, open studio tours to fundraise. And, um, Beatrice was one of the early members of those tours. The very first tour, Myra Toth, a member, helped design the brochures and maps of the studio, of the studios that were going to be included. Uh, the next studio tour following that one, Burt Collins would do all the lettering and maps uh, of the studios all by hand. And this was before computers and printers. 
Beatrice Woods studio was one of these first studios, which, which by the use of her name and fame, and this is where fame came in handy for us because she supported our little events because of her name and fame. And, and at the same time, she also donated her artwork to, for posters for our events. Well, this last fundraiser it, it, with Beto, we also had articles going to the Sunset Magazine and the Los Angeles Times art scene uh, mm -hmm. for this particular tour. And oh my gosh, it was so successful. It was over the top. In fact, the studio tour was so successful, it became its own organization and was renamed Ojai Studio Artists and is still going strong today and proudly has given over, over the 30 years $100,000 in student um, art scholarships. I give credit to Osa's success, to Beatrice Wood, for her support of these early tours in the, in the beginning. Now let's go on. She just didn't stop there in the arts community and the, uh, she, she helped the government, <laughs> as it were, the city hall. In the late 80s, the Ojai City Hall presented Beatrice Woods' its very first ever Lifetime Achievement Award in the arts. And with the help of then mayor, Nina Shelley, the city is now awakened to the vibrant art scene in Ojai. We were never considered a resource in Ojai. We were just sort of a subgroup, not, not to bother with. But now we are in the city hall. Um, politics, help. Um, the, the art scene has finally been recognized as a resource for the city, as much as the music festival that brings guests into um, visitors to Ojai. And in the 90s, Ojai created an, um, the Ojai in early 90s, the, the city hall created an arts advisory board. That's just sort of volunteer people to help advise the, the city um, uh, council. Later, they were replaced by an arts committee, which had a little more influence. And then afterwards, they were replaced by an official arts commission. And this was a big deal because now, arts are part of the city's um, budget. They have a budget now. The city's art commission in the beginning installed a city arts gallery in the city hall. The arts commission created a city art collection of local artists. They created a bi-monthly art exhibit at City Hall, and I'm sure that there's more that they did, but this is what I remember for me. And Beatrice supported the City Art Collection by donating a piece of artwork called the Blue Fish, and I think we sent a picture of that one, and it's uh, a crystal quartz ceramic piece, and at that time it was valued at $3,800 to the City Arts Collection. So she, with her name and fame, kind of made our collection respectable, as it were. Now, for one of my favorite memories of Beatrice, I want to take you back to the Beaux-Arts Ball in, in the early 80s, before all the art was, um, all before all this art stuff happened. And we're just starting out. We're so excited that Beatrice is going to be the queen of the ball. The night that of opening night of this ball, everybody, there was a crowd outside waiting for Beatrice to arrive. And she didn't disappoint us because she came in a horse-drawn cart, lifted out of the cart onto a litter with four beautiful shirtless young men carrying her through the crowd over a rose-petaled 
red carpet that was stretched from the street to the entrance of the art center and once in was lifted onto her throne above the crowd. <laughs> and once placed on the throne above the crowd, she commanded, let the ball begin. But, but unknown to us, I really believe this command was the very beginning of the art scene coming alive again in Ohio. Thank you, Beatrice. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gail. So next we have Bob Zah. He's the co-founder of Peace Press and responsible for the incredible edition of I Shock Myself, which is Beatrice Wood's autobiography. So I'm really glad to be here. You know, uh, Beatrice was like an alchemical force for people. And we're hearing some of that tonight, how uh, she connected people up to different things. and. Here it is 23 years later after she's passed away and we're still together. And some of us had the chance to not just meet her and be friends with her, but help her with her own visibility. So we have you know, Garth Clark who put that ceramic art out there in the galleries in LA and museums and, and ultimately all over the world. And you had Francis Nowen who lifted her up in academia and with the Smithsonian Institute. I mean, you can go to the Smithsonian Institute and you can read her three line a day diary that she kept for over 80 years. You can go right on there and read it. And, you know, Francis Nauman has really kept her spirit alive with his work over many, many decades. And for me, I got to come along and publish I Shock Myself. I went, I went on this date 40 years ago. I asked this woman out and she said, why don't you come with me? Uh, I'm in a string quartet and you can watch me play. So I went up with her and it was at Rupert Pohl's house and he lived with Anna East Nen who had just passed away. So I'm watching this string quartet at, up at Silver Lake. There's a, there's a moon shining down on the lake and all this music. What attracted me was there was a gold museum catalog on the table in front of me. I opened it up and it was uh, Cal State Fullerton's, uh, they did a retrospective on Beatrice for her 90th birthday. I was really intrigued by it. And besides running Peace Press, I booked a talk show on Channel 4 called At One With, and I decided to drive up and meet Beatrice. And so I called her up, went up there, met her. Then I brought my producer back because Beatrice was still unknown, even though she was over 90. And I wanted to make sure the producer was on board with this. And she was. Beatrice captivates everybody. And uh, she uh, you know, was a big success on it, one with and every other media event she ever did in her life. She's always connected with people. So we became friends and I asked her if she had done a book, an autobiography. She said, yeah, yeah, I, I got one going. And, uh, so she gave it to me to read and I read it and I was kind of disappointed because her spirit was not in the book. It just wasn't there. So I talked to her again. I said, there's just something missing. Did you, did you edit this? She said, well, I had this mathematician from Boston uh, edit the book and that's kind of what it felt like. It felt like uh, a mathematician had gotten involved in it. So I, I rounded up uh, Lindsay Smith who was a screenwriter and she sat out with Beatrice over the next year to pull the stories out and to put the spirit of Beatrice back in her own autobiography. <clears throat> then I asked Beatrice, uh, so, so you're publishing this? Yeah. She says, yeah. She says, uh, this uh, artist, he's publishing the book. He uh, gave me $10,000 and he took away a bunch of pottery and he's publishing the book. And so well, it sounds to me like he bought $10,000 worth of pottery and you're publishing the book. <laughs> and so I decided to talk to him. I decided to call him up on the phone and I did some Rosicrucian mumbo jumbo in my head before I talked to him so that I could be effective. And I told him pretty much that he was basically buying pottery and Beatrice was publishing the book. And he said, well, what, what would it require to do this book? 
And so I said it would cost about $25,000. And this was the first among many magical events around Beatrice for me. He said, he said, okay, he says, I'll do it on one condition. I'll give you a non-recourse loan for $25,000. Well, I'm a hippie from Los Angeles. So I had to ask him what that meant. And he said, well, it means that if you don't make the money back, you don't owe me anything. And we, we weren't even in the same state. We're on the phone. He's never met me. And he loaned the money for this book. I was very careful. I never asked him for any of it until I had actually needed it. So we got that book out. And then we, uh, we had an opening at Garth. Clark studio and the book barely made it. I had to go to the bindery and find out that they had not smice sewn it. And it was three days before the event and the van bringing the books had a flat tire on the way to the event. The book should have been at Garth's gallery three or four days before the event. And they arrived two hours before the event. To the public, it looked like a real smooth running affair, but it just wasn't. It was, tore my, tore my hair out. It was, it was, really stress, stress inducing for me. So, you know, I started hanging with Beatrice and uh, I took a lot of women up there. It was a great first date to take a woman to meet Beatrice Wood. And, uh, you know, finally Beatrice goes, Bob, that's the one, that one right there. That's who you're supposed to marry. And uh, I did marry her. <laughs> we're divorced, but we're still great friends. Uh, Inguna loves Beatrice. They loved each other. I brought all these women up there. Sometimes I would bring people up there because Beto was an alchemical force and she could just change you. I'd bring some woman I knew or worked with that seemed stuck in her life and I would bring her up there and I'd just step back and let Beatrice go to work, go to work on her and really doing nothing. But she just had an effect on you. I saw some some guy in the movie industry brought up Mia Sara, the star of Ferris Bueller, because she was having a problem breakup. And she sat at the feet, literally at the feet of Beto while Beatrice you know, walked her through uh, what, what was going on in her life. I went to Beatrice Wood's uh, 105th birthday. And a uh, strange thing happened there was I had set up one of my printing customers with our lawyer at Peace Press, Susan Grode. And so I set her up to be the lawyer for Matt Groening, who created The Simpsons. And so at this 105th birthday party, Deborah Groening was there. Then I'd set up Susan Grode to be Beatrice Wood's attorney. So I had this connection and I showed up at the 105th and I, I'd quit my job. I wasn't doing anything. Deborah Groening was there and she said, uh, why don't you come to work for Matt? And so at that party, I got the job that I'm still at 23 years later. Mm. If, I, I'd like to give my impression, if you take a minute or so here, about how I think Beatrice Wood died. And she died like a week after the uh, 105th birthday. She, she had lunch with Gloria Stewart and James Cameron. And after that, I was told that she stopped eating. And I think the way I see it, the impression I have is that Beatrice had done everything. She'd published books, she'd done the pottery, she'd written, she'd done drawings and so on. An incredible life. We tried to get a movie about her made, but it just, it just never happened. And then along comes James Cameron making Titanic and he decides to make the character Rose, Beatrice Wood. And I was not interested in seeing that film until I read in the LA Times, the day it came out, that this movie was based on Beatrice Wood. She wasn't on the boat, but for that movie to make all that money and be three and a half hours long, if you didn't have a dynamic old person in that role, it wouldn't hold together. People would just walk out. And they brought Gloria Stewart up there. They throwed her out, showed her how to throw pots and, and you know, put rings on her toes. And she nailed it. It was perfect. And my feeling is that after she had lunch with them, there was literally nothing left to do. She was, there was a movie kind of about her. 
she had done everything. I'm done eating, and and you know let me let me pass on. And yet we're here keeping her alive today. She's just just the hugest force in my life and many other lives. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, so next we will hear from Donna Granada, founder and executive director of Focus on the Masters Arts Archive and Library. Well, I first want to say thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, it's really wonderful to hear all these great stories from everyone. Um, I grew up in Ojai and there was never a time I didn't know about Beatrice. Uh, in those early days, she was um, making a lot of public appearances. She spoke at Nordoff High School. That was the very first time I had seen her. Uh, but, you know, throughout the years and the evolution of the art community, she continued to support not only the Ojai Studio artists, but when I established an archive and library 27 years ago, she was extremely supportive. And um, throughout the years leading up to the Focus on the Masters archive, you know, I just would make the trek up there like every artist would. Um, and I'll never forget, I, I had seen her and been part of an audience with her on several occasions, but to have a one-on-one -on -one with her the very first time when I went up to the house of, up at Happy Valley, uh, I remember distinctly, I was wearing white tennis shoes and I came in and you know, as many of you know, she would sit in the living room and she would have her audience there and often would be drawing while uh, visiting. And she came, she, I was introduced um, and she looked at me and she looked down at my shoes and she said, you know, you should paint those shoes. And, I, and I, it was just such an odd thing to say. And then she followed that up with, you know, I'm a very generous woman. And if you pursue that idea, I will support that. And of course, I was so young at the time and I, I had no idea that I should have followed up on that very generous offer. And I never did do it. But as you know, today, you can buy shoes that have been hand painted and they're quite the rage. But anyway, um, Many years later in 1989, I had the opportunity to witness her being painted by the renowned painter, David LaFell. And I took a, a portrait of the two of them. It was a benefit for uh, Oak Grove School and this beautiful portrait was produced. And that photograph really was the one that kind of launched this idea of starting an arts archive and documenting the artists who live and work within the community. And among the documentation um, is an official portrait that is included with the archive and associated with the artist. Um, and each time the portraits are shown in, in group exhibitions or solo exhibitions, um, there would be a small biography that would go with them. And I did my homework and I found out that Beatrice had never been photographed with chocolate and young men. And I remember the bow art ball and I remember this visual of these young men with no shirts, you know, carrying Beatrice in to the art center. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get myself some young men. And we staged the whole thing without Vito knowing about it. She knew that she was going to visit with me, but she had no idea and that there was going to be a photograph, but she had no idea what I had planned. And I got up there early. I had four young men that I uh, solicited from the uh, various gyms in the community and I paid them with a portrait of Beatrice. And um, we shot the whole thing with a stand-in. So when she came out, she would be completely surprised. And I went by the Ojai Museum and I borrowed a beautiful red gold sari that she had donated to the museum. And ironically, that would be, my understanding is that that sari would be worn by a virgin bride. So she loved that too. So we brought up the sari, she put it on. And when she came out, here's all these young men and she just lit up like a Christmas tree. And she looked at these men and she said, oh, at last my dreams have come true. And we all just cracked up and laughed hysterically. And she just 
her, you know, the, the smile was from the heart and it was so sincere and she was batting her eyes and flirting with these young men and they didn't know what hit them because they had no idea who she was. So it was quite, quite the, um, quite the experience. And I was trying to get, you know, a great, uh, expression of her and so i'm directing at the camera and I, i'm saying you know Beto, i i want you to just reach for the chocolate don't touch the chocolate but just reach for it and then look over at me and then she looks at the men and she's looking at all you know she's looking at them both and she says i don't know if i want to touch the chocolate or the young men <laughs> so it, it, it's a great story and uh, a girlfriend of mine was a la times uh, food photographer and she uh, was the one that got all the chocolate and arranged all the chocolate and i remember we were um brought into the kitchen and i said well we'd like to put the chocolate on platters you know of Vito's platters and so we go into the kitchen and um the studio assistant opened up the the cupboards and there was all these gorgeous Vito plates and pots and goblets and just you know stacked up in those cupboards and I'll, I'll never forget that but um, she was certainly uh, one of the most extraordinary women I've ever met and every time I would go up uh, I just it was recharged really just the drive up there and then to stand with you know in the garden walk around the studio, sit with her for a few minutes was always a great honor and pleasure. And um, I know my life's enriched by that experience. So I, I'm honored to be part of the panel and uh, I'm thankful for every minute I got to spend with her. And I was at the 105th birthday party as well. And I was stunned that, you know, on the day she passed, all of her thank you notes were postmarked. And it, it's a great tribute to all the people who worked with her and helped her um, run the day-to-day -day studio um, and her, her life. I mean, she had a fantastic team and, um, and I'm grateful to have those memories. So, <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, Donna. Um, so next up we have Nancy Martinez. She's a former gallery manager and studio assistant to Beatrice Wood. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. And first off, I would like to say happy birthday, Beatrice. <laughs> happy birthday. Um, uh, it's great to hear all of these recollections and reminiscences of Beatrice and the way in which she touched us all. And it really is a testament to who she was. She was known for her artwork and her cheeky sense of humor. Beatrice had the greatest generosity of spirit um, and of her, of her, her being, of any human being that I've ever known. She was interested in life. She lived it with such a sense of wonder and, um, and thirst for it. So I came to visit her just like anybody else did, but there was a kindred spirit between us from the moment we met. And days after I'd gone back to Los Angeles teaching my little pottery class, I was about to write her a thank you note and I got one from her saying, thank you for visiting. Here is a video that I think your, your students might like. So that's the kind of person that she was. She, when you were in the room with her, she was genuinely interested in you and what you were doing. Um, and while we were all just thrilled to be in her presence, um, I think that people coming to her and infusing her with some of life outside in the world might've contributed a little bit to the continuation of what she was doing and, and inspiring her too. I don't know if too many people know how philanthropic she was and how with every opportunity that was presented to her to give back in life, in the time that I spent with her, which was the latter part of her life and we were winding things up and getting things finished and putting things together and finishing glazing her pottery and signing all of her lithographs and drawings that 
had been left scattered about and getting things in order, um, she she just had a, a, a great feeling of um, almost responsibility to give back. So she never forgot the time that uh, her home in North Hollywood was nearly or almost completely destroyed by a flood and the Red Cross came to her aid. That's another story in itself. In order to get the aid, she wound up having to marry Steve and, but long story short, she made it to Ohio with the help of the, the Red Cross and she never forgot that. And, and there, there are people who came in and out of her life all through it. I was lucky enough to be at the end, but there were people like Lynn and Danny and Robert and Anna and, and Mr. Singh and Dave and Kevin and Stephanie and Dania and so many people who throughout the years uh, played bit parts in her life. Um, I didn't really prepare anything. So um, in, in light of it being Beatrice's birthday, I did prepare one thing and I hope you all don't mind because she loved chocolate so much and it is her birthday. I got a, um, a chocolate eclair and a chocolate raspberry bud cake. And what do you say folks? You wanna sing happy birthday? <laughs> is, that, is that inappropriate? <laughs> You started off. <laughs> All right, here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. I want to see your mouths move. Happy birthday, dear Beato. Happy birthday to you. And this is where your part comes in. Because Beatrice would want your wishes to come true. So everybody make a wish in honor of Beatrice and for yourself. And I'll blow out the candles. And I get the eclair, so I'll be here. <laughs> um, and one thing I wanted to say to, to Jeff and Robert um, about that that um, postcard with the with the men lined up that you remember. Um, she had that postcard around for quite a while, and I think it's still in the studio. And when people would come to visit her, she used to take a poll. From, all, from many, many people that would come through. And Lynn, you're out there. I think you remember this. She would ask people which, which one they liked the best. And she kind of could, she kept notes about that. So it was kind of fun. Personally, every moment that I spent with Beatrice was wonderful. Um, we had her ups and downs up at the studios over the years, but every single moment from some days that she would wake up and yell waffles, to the times that we'd be in the studio trying to figure out what went wrong with the kiln or how we could make it better. Um, every day was magic. And I'm gonna close with one little story um, of a day when Lori Blackman was one of the caregivers who came to work there. And the first day that she was there, I was showing her around and we were doing our business. And I noticed something outside that I knew Beatrice had to see. So I grabbed Lori. I said, get, get her chair, please, and come with me. And I said, Beatrice, do you trust me? She said, yes. And I said, get up and come with me. We're going outside. And so we wheeled her outside. And from the hillside in Happy Valley, there are all of these people, men, we assumed, that were paragliding and parasailing. There were like 10 or 12 of them. And so we got scarves and we were waving them at the men. And Beatrice said, oh, men falling from the sky. <laughs> and you know that was one of that was one of the most fun days that I had. But things like that, magic little things, happened when you were around her. And um, it's with great respect and gratitude that I say happy birthday and thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was so special. Um, so next, we'll hear from Lisa Casoni, Heather Stobo, and Emily Burson, the founders of Vito Chocolate. Hi, everybody. We're so excited to be part of this. And um, hi, Kevin. Kevin's really important to this whole story. But um, we're Beto Chocolates. And um, we're coming to you from the Porch Gallery, which is a live work building in downtown Ojai. 
We're really shouting out to all of our Ojai friends that we saw tonight on, um, on Zoom. And this building is really special because uh, not only do we live and work in it, but Vito Chocolates was um, conceived and started right here in this building. And we made the chocolate and um, it is now uh, very, we're incredibly grateful now the chocolate's being made in a bigger facility because people love it so much. But I'm gonna take you back really briefly how we started this company. So uh, like what we're going through right now in COVID, a couple of years ago, there was another major thing we all went through in Ojai, which was the Thomas fire. So all three of us um, evacuated together and we were away for a number of days, not knowing what was happening in our town or we, whether we were gonna come back to anything. And so after a few days, we uh, started thinking about legacy losses in Ojai. And of course we're in the art business. We have an art gallery in, in downtown Ojai. So Beto, um, came to us in a very deep way because every day when we evacuated, they served this chocolate in the afternoon. And this was in December of 2017, and it was very comforting. So we're gonna turn something around in the building where we're at right now and show you. It's the, I owe it all to art folks, chocolates and young men. So the, we have that actually permanently displayed in the gallery right now. So anybody that comes and sees us knows, and um, we spent a lot of time talking about the Beto story, and she's, she is such a huge influence and impact to our lives here. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the chocolate. So the chocolate that um, we create on a daily basis called Beto, chocolate. called Beto Chocolates, which was obviously Beto's um, loving nickname, is, um, is all fair trade. And it's, the, you know, the, the thing about the chocolate is people love it, but here's the best part about the story. And this is why I love hearing from everybody tonight. We are trying to keep Beto's legacy going. And how we do that is through something she loved, which is chocolate. And so every day when we make this chocolate and when we sell this chocolate, we're working with Beto's legacy in, this, in the sense that we are using- Her um, ceramic molds. Her ceramic molds. So we're gonna hold these up a little bit. I don't bit. know if we, like, can you guys see them? Yeah. To make our chocolate molds. So that's your yeah. horse. This is, this is the signature one right here, which is the moon face. So the moon face was actually our first chocolate. We were highly inspired by that one because Ojai is the Valley of the Moon. And so this moon face of uh, Beto's, which was a small sculpture, is people say that they, they don't even want to eat it because it's so pretty. And that's, what, that's one of the things that we love hearing is that it's this sculptural piece that Beto actually made herself, but is now out there in the world as a chocolate. About, about a year ago, we started with chocolate bars. And so um, chocolate bars are really important to us because inspired by they're inspired by her artwork. So here's one. Well, let's, let's go this Yeah, I'm gonna show you a couple so of them. So there's um, Naja Toi. <laughs> uh, Happy Valley. Um, oh, here, Pigeon Spaniards. And I shock myself. So and here's oh, here, here are two really new quickly, ones. The two new ones. Um, I can't see which one this is. <laughs> the pussy between us. <laughs> and bored at a cocktail party. These were these directly from artwork of Beto's that we then work with local farmers as well to put ingredients into these bars that relate to what the what the um, artwork was about. Everything's very purposeful when we come out with a new bar or a new sculptural piece. And we're very proud that part of this goes back to the Beatrice Wood Center too. This is a complete integration of legacy and Ojai and history and chocolate. You know, anybody that comes to Ojai, we always encourage them to learn about Beto, to read about her. We have her, all her books here in the gallery. We're highly um, encouraged and inspired to come up with new ideas from her travels, her stories, her life, her legacies, her loves, her losses. So many things about this woman uh, are really inspiring to us on a daily basis. So here's the one, this is our first packaging. So obviously we use the blind man. Yeah. And, um, and our, I don't know if you can see our tagline is kind of playing off the Dadaism. It's our tagline is anti-established in Ojai, California. So it's, just, um, it's basically, it's, we're just constantly like referring back to her life or her, 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 you know, one of the few women who's like credited with like starting an art movement. That's, let's like take a pause for that. What an amazing thing that is. Like, you know, known as a mama of Dada, 
really like that's a really amazing thing that very few women are credited with that but that's what's so important for us is to really dive into her legacy yeah. and honor it, honor and honor it and reimagine it through chocolate um i think before we go to a quick q a um steven and hi tyler um had something that they wanted to share briefly well, first of all I wanted to draw attention to Francis uh, Nauman spoke about uh, his autobiography, which is superb. And everybody, all of you people out there that are interested in and love uh, Beatrice, read Francis's autobiography. It is really, really excellent. In, in 84, I wrote my first book on the first Mac in Maine. I li we live in Maine, in Maine. And uh, the next year I taught Beatrice how to use a computer for the first time. And right thereafter, she began writing, um, uh, I shocked myself. Uh, it's, that's why she wanted to learn it. So, you know, being with a woman who is 85 would be um, 92, um, was, yeah, 92, you know, teaching a 92 year old how to use a computer. And, and she was good. She was an incredible student. she complained student. it worked too slowly. Yes, she complained. But the, the story that I asked to tell was, when um, she was a hundred and uh, Christmas before her hundred and third birthday, uh, I gave her, I'd always, we'd traveled so much around the world together and she was just great. Uh, you know, my trip in India with her, Helene and I in uh, Paris with her for the opening of the Beauborg in London, et cetera. And then she couldn't travel anymore and she loved to travel. So I traveled vicariously for her and I would find things. I would take photographs. I became a photographer so I could show um, a professional photographer, but so I could show Beatrice photographs of places, a uh, folk art and craft. And then I would buy things for her that I would give her uh, that I knew that she would love. And I found this uh, tribal comb. I'm trying to get it so you can see it. Let's see. How's Stop it going? moving it. Whoop. It's a tribal comb. I'm, there we go. Uh, a tribal comb from Borneo um, that uh, I gave to her on Christmas for her 103rd, before 103rd birthday. And immediately thereafter, I got a um, Christmas, I'm trying to change the background so you can see it. Um, I got a Christmas, a, a thank you from her with uh, saying that she wanted to use that as a prototype for a chalice. After her 103rd birthday, she sent us this. Mm. <laughs> um, as you can see, now that I am off that. Oh my Beautiful. Same uh, piece there. And then uh, after she died, um, we were given, bequeathed this, uh, this call. So to me, we keep them always together. And at some point, I'd spoken with Kevin about it. I'd love to do an exhibition. There was going to have been one that I was going to curate at the, because I curate exhibitions at Mingay International Museum in San Diego about Beatrice, about her intelligence, but also pairing uh, her folk art collection, because that's what she started me in, is documenting folk art, and the pieces that she made that were inspired by folk art. So I was going to use this, these two, but then borrow pieces from her folk art collection and put them, pair them with uh, vessels uh, and other, and drawings, etc., that were inspired by them. If that doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, but I just want to... Let, let, let's make it happen. Let's yeah, make it happen. Also, all of you people, you have told the most wonderful stories. It's just brought it back so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kevin and Rachel for hosting this and for all of you for doing yes, it. It's indeed. wonderful. Thank you. And I just wanted to say one, a lot of people have touched on her, her charm and her mesmerizing qualities. And uh, uh, often in uh, soppy romance books or cheap movies, you see people referred to as some woman enters a room and everybody is riveted by her and, and all the men are agog. And Beatrice is the only person that I ever met that could actually have that effect on a room, no matter how old she was. She completely enchanted every, every male in the room, gay, straight, or whatever it didn't matter they were all entranced and i was always in awe of that talent 
And she had every uh, right to do that because she was a, a goddess. She really was. The women who did the chocolate thing mentioned that drawing that Beatrice uh, did called uh, The Pussy Between Us. And yes, and you can see there's a cat. Uh, is there a cat on her lap? Yeah. Yeah, well, I it was a drawing similar to that one, not that one. And I once said, because she had titled it, The Pussy Between Us, and I said, you do realize there's a double meaning to the word pussy, don't you? And she said to me, well, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> that was her response. And I should say that she, she also understood that double meaning, and everyone knows how much she loved cats. And I once asked her if she really believed in a hereafter. And if she did, I made her promise that if there is a hereafter, she has to let me know. And I don't know what form you want to take that. Uh, she said, well, how about if I do it as a cat? She said, because if I believe in anything, it's a possibility of reincarnation. And may, so I have spent the last 23 years waiting for my cat to give me a message. Uh, and I have never been without a cat since then. And I have to say, when Donna was talking about Beatrice, Donna, you were unaware of this, but behind you, your white cat walked into the scene. And that, to me, came across as a bit of a, a message. So, Well, and she's been, she's been yelling at me the whole time. Uh, it's Clarabelle, Clarabelle Cone, named after the collector. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I, and I, she loved her dog. <clears throat> there she is again. She's behind you now. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's hungry. <laughs> but the dogs also. And I remember, and um, Nancy, what was the name of the Labrador, the blonde Labrador? Nancy. Uh, Nero? Yeah. Was it Arrow? No, Nero. There was Nero. No, Nero was the, um, oh, yeah. the, the German oh. shepherd. Yes the blonde German shepherd. And I remember I was up there one day and we were all sitting on the couch and I had brought some people up to visit with her. And the dog came in and knocked a bowl off of the oh, no. uh, the coffee table and it shattered. And when you said, I'll, I'll just make another one, that's exactly yeah. what she said. She goes, oh, don't worry about it. I can make another one. But all of us were shocked and, um, but, she loved her animals, the cats and the dogs and all living creatures, frankly. She, a woman came to see her um, and I was sort of tending the storeroom and she answered the door and the woman uh, came up with a dog. And Beatrice asked her, do you sleep with her dog? And the woman said, no. And Beatrice slammed the door in her face. I saw her do this. So it was a kind of joke, but she did not think it was proper for a dog not to sleep in the bed with its owner. Uh, I sleep with two dogs in my bed every night and a cat and a wife. Donna, you, talked, Donna, you talked about seeing her cupboard. Wasn't it you that said seeing her yeah. cupboard? Yeah. So that's what she ate off. We ate yeah. off with her every single day. Hundreds of meals, um, these chalice in this place enchiladas. and they did break you know they broke and they were chipped to yeah. make more well and, and i gotta say the the food was always fantastic and all of the vegetarian uh recipes that she had i always thought it'd be great to do a recipe book because and kevin and his lovely <laughs> wife are fantastic cooks but that was the first time i was introduced to vegan cuisine and i was shocked how much I loved the food. And always she put out just an incredible spread. Just the, 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 the recipe book is in the works. We're working oh, on the recipe book. Great. 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 Much of that was inspired by the hookers, by the ranch house, right. by, by Alan and, and Helen Hooker. She uh, was great friends with them and adored them and used a lot of their recipes, but you know, with her own twist. Yeah, a lot of the recipes we have are either um, from the hookers from the original um, restaurant or Rosalind, who was very much into nutrition, her best friend Rosalind. So anyway, we have all, we have all these handwritten recipes, so we're working on it. Uh, the uh, one thing is uh, Beto had uh, 
a dear friend, Rosalind Roger Paul, who, who lived next door to her for a hundred years, practically. And uh, Rosalind was a bit of a food crank and would always tell you oh, what the unhealthy food you were eating was going to do to your intestines and stuff while you were eating, which was unpleasant. And she was a big, big uh, champion of carob, saying that carob and chocolate were, were equally good. And so you didn't have to eat chocolate. And we were at uh, dinner at Beto's and she was having ice cream with uh, syrup for dessert. And she had two pitchers in her hand that she was taking to the table. And she said, now, one of these is carob syrup and one of these is chocolate <laughs> syrup. And I'm not going to tell you which is which. Just don't let this one come anywhere near me. <laughs> <laughs> And when when they moved, Rosalind was there. Yeah. And when they moved into their new houses up on the on the hill, they had a big housewarming party, and Rosalind had made these horrible dried up gagia roofing tile carob brownies, and Beatrice made these luscious moist chocolate brownies, and Beatrice's were gone in about a nanosecond, and Rosalind's were completely there at the end of the party, except for a few that were later found in potted plants and <laughs> trash cans and things. They were just horrible. Like Beto considered it one of her great victories. Rosalind started eating chocolate, like when, when Rosalind was really elderly, you know. Um, and Beto was like, she's finally eating chocolate. She, she considered it such a victory, you know. <laughs> she did sincerely loved chocolate and she always had a ton of it available but. yeah that, that's one of the reasons we love the beetle chocolates doing what they're doing is because they're they're carrying on that love of chocolate in, in an artistic way and um, I've always told museum curators people are looking at acquiring his work you think about exhibitions that Beto has legs Beatrice Wood will exist forever. It really came home to me when there was a show at the Santa Monica Museum of Art Retrospective, where I, where people were showing up and they'd said, I never heard of her. I went to this. There were the videos. She was talking. I fell in love with this woman. She's my hero. And I realized that Beatrice Wood, I mean, as Francis was talking about, Beatrice Wood is going to be alive forever because she does have legs. She is still able to connect with people, still able to, to do that. So did I see that? Um, so let's open it up for a quick Q and A. It looks someone said that um, slow mo Roz has a question. Is that it's Sylvia Roz? Okay. Um, yes. Thank you because uh, I'm not in the list of uh, speakers, but I have something to say. I'm an artist in Ohio, and uh, I am here 25 years or more. And the first thing I did when we came to live in Ojai was to visit Beatrice Wood because I feel that she was the one that inspired me to leave Los Angeles and come to Ojai. I loved her last year. I loved more than anything, I think her personality. And I felt I had to get close to her. She almost stole my husband. You know, he was a very good looking guy at the time. She just, we went to visit her. I said to him, you must meet her. And we went with our tray of chocolate and uh, we got in and she's sitting, of course, in her chair's lounge with her cat. And she looks at me all over and she says to us, uh, the, the Hindu assistant that she had for many, many years. So, so she said to, uh, to him, uh, leave him here with me. What a good looking guy he is, your husband. And you go and take her around. So I was very offended because she was dangerous. So she, she, uh, uh, he showed me the studio and everything. And uh, that was one of the things I loved her for. But the other thing was that, you see, I'm from Uruguay. I am from Tango country. We in Uruguay have the pride of the uh, composer that wrote the most famous tango, La Cumparcita. So she, I, I loved when she said that uh, she would gladly sell her soul to the devil 
if you had the chance to dance tango with a nice looking Argentinian. Can you switch over, Rachel, to the um, the Brady Bunch view? You're too young to understand the Brady Bunch view, but where where everybody's in the window, all yeah. the speakers. Is that oh, possible? I see Beth has a has a question. Hey, so oh, it's Beth. It's Beth. So Brady Bunch. I was thinking Hollywood Squares. Um, yes. What What was uh, her relationship with Krishna Murti? What? How did those two mingle because they're both kind of powerhouses how did how did that how was that i, I would give that to um steven um and then maybe francis well I, I i mean they met um as you'll see in their auto autobiography in her autobiography um so bob can answer that too but um they met when she was uh in new york and went to hear him speak and just found what he said deeply evocative and, and fascinating and then moved to California to be near him. Um, what there was their relationship, they were friends and they respected one another. Um, uh, their, she was, Rosalind was their closest friend and Raja Kapal was Krishnamurti's uh, right hand um, <laughs> until he sort of eschewed him, which uh, Beatrice felt was beneath Krishnamurti. So after that time, I think she lost some respect, honestly, for Krishnamurti because he, she felt that he dissed a person who was entirely honorable and had only spent his life caring for Krishnamurti. Beyond that, she still always deeply respected his philosophy and um, what, what he said. Um, but I think that she found that there was a certain dichotomy in, in those two things. I don't know. Sure. On that, I, I mean, Francis, you can say some things. Bob could probably say things too. I remember when I first met Beatrice, she told me about Krishnamurti, and I asked her if the fact that she was wearing saris had anything to do with it. Was it because of her religion? And she said, "Oh no, no, not my religion. Krishnamurti has nothing to do with religion." So I said, "Well, why are you wearing saris?" And she said, "Because I love chocolate and young men." And I said, well, wait a minute. I just asked you why you wear saris. What do you mean you love chocolate and young men? And then she leaned over to me and whispered, stupid, silly boy, I'm fat under here. <laughs> that, ah, that was, okay, I need to get That was her okay. explanation. She loves chocolate and young men. She's never going to be able to get the young men if she's looking fat. So, but she can have both with a, with a sari, with the help of a sari. <laughs> but Beatrice really didn't she made it an ethical thing not to talk ill of people. So I, yeah. when I spent weeks interviewing her for a biography, which I've never written, but uh, when I did, I tried to kind of draw that out for her, Beth, from her, Beth, uh, yeah. about her attitude towards uh, Krishnamurti. And it honestly wasn't easy because she does, didn't like to speak ill of people. And I, I you could see but behind the lines and she, we certainly discussed uh, his affair with Rosalind and and what that meant, the the it, seeming hypocrisy of it. But she still was loath to to point yeah. fingers ever, uh, yeah. and that was one of the things that I respected most about her. Uh, it was something she, you know she really felt that each person should be honored for who they were. Um, right. Yeah. Well, she also had a tremendous respect for privacy. And that was something I remember talking to her about fame. And, you know, we were talking about that earlier, but she, she was a firm believer that even though somebody was famous, they were still uh, entitled to their right to privacy. And I remember when the uh, Clinton scandal took place um, and she had a lot to say about all of that and how he was treated through that whole experience, but that stuck with me. And that was something that we always honored in the documentation of our artists, that if there were certain aspects of their privacy that they wanted to keep private, we would respect that. And that, that came directly from Beatrice. And the other thing, I think an important thing to, I, be, I believe to state is that Beatrice 
and this I, I, I am sure of, I have in many quotes in those interviews that I did with her. Um, she, even though she had a great time, um, you know, I have, we have dozens and dozens of drawings and Francis has more of, of erotic drawings of Beatrice, but even though she had a great deal of fun talking about licentiousness, Beatrice is one of the most moral people we, I've ever met. And she absolutely, without question, declaratively state that she stated that she never had an affair with anyone that and would and would not have had an affair with anyone that was involved with anyone else. She would not have yeah. done that. So the whole question of menage a trois, the whole question of any of that was, as far as she stated declaratively, not happening. She had an uh, affair with Duchamp. She had an affair with uh, uh, um, Dara, but never at the same time. And she was very, very, you know, she would flirt outrageously with every man she met, uh, more or less, but she would never have actually seduced one. Yeah, th this, is, this is involved with somebody else. Yeah, this is something that Francis is actually, you know, looking after the historical record and in fact checking. <laughs> essays has been very clear about that um, we need to be very honest about who this woman was. Yeah. Um, right, you right. know, I, I should, I can throw in one thing. She, I once said to her, she was already by then well into her 90s. And I said, look, Beatrice, you flirt with absolutely every male that walks into this showroom in such a way, what would happen? And I actually thought of this I, I don't know that I could ever have acted on it, but I said, well, what would happen if someone like, say, like me, took you up on it? And she said, that's disgusting. <laughs> when I, when I was that was her, her When I was 20, we traveled in India together, and um, we were going into a village area, and we were uh, taken into a guest house. And I, I was 20, and she, she was 79. And uh, we were ushered into the same bedroom and proudly told that um, Nehru had slept there. And the, the um, inn the owner of the guest house was so nice uh, that we were very careful not to make him feel badly, although we said we needed two rooms. And, but as soon as he left, we just about died laughing. And I, of course, 20, you know, you never know. I thought, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I did. She was. I mean, I was besotted with her, but you know, we didn't. At any rate, then there's a series of erotic drawings that she made about the two of us, and and she even mentions it in uh, her autobiography, uh, the two of us in Nehru's bedroom. You know, and it was just so much fun. Um, one uh, one thing on the afterlife that she told me once that she decided that in heaven there was going to be no such bourgeois restrictions of one man, one woman, and that you could have all the men you wanted. And she had decided you could, you could have any man from history, no matter what age, because <laughs> they, they would all be there. And her stable that she had, she had decided she wanted was um, Gorbachev, because she admired him, Bill Moyers for, for, for intellect, Charlie Chaplin for laughs, uh, Prince Albert, Victoria's husband, for because she thought he was beautiful and smart, and uh, Trader Joe. Trader Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and Trader Joe went to her, I think it was her 80th birthday. No, no, it was my 100th. 100th birthday. 100th birthday yeah. in Pacific Design Center. Yeah, in LA, and uh, they were introduced, and she was a bit embarrassed, but he was a very good looking guy, and well dressed and all, so she was rather, rather happy to meet him, <laughs> thrilled to meet her. All right, we have another question from Sheila, I guess I'll just read it aloud. How much did she interact with other Ojai Potters, the Hinos, etc.? Well, we'll have to start with the high nose because that was definitely a, a long-term relationship that came before Ojai. So whoever wants to address that? Francis? 
I can speak a little on it. I, I knew them both and they were, they were great friends and um, Vivica and Otto um, were mentors of Beatrice's and, and I, I probably, well, they were colleagues, they were associates and um, Otto had given her pointers on her throwing and, um, and uh, she also worked with uh, Frank Noyes who lived to be nearly a hundred years old. And Frank mm. was instrumental in helping her develop um, and perfect her luster firing techniques. So um, I know that th they were great friends in Ojai uh, and Otto and Vivica and uh, Frank Noyes. So I know that. Yes. Awesome. Well, Otto and Heino uh, buy Beatrice's first home. Mm -hmm. Yes. The East End. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, apparently, as the story goes, um, she, Beatrice Wood was invited by Rosalind to build her home and studio up in Happy Valley, which would then be left to, you know, there. And that, then that would be the beginning, uh, or not the beginning, but the continuation of Annie Besson's vision, that there would be an artist there and working. And so um, when that happened, Beatrice Wood called the Hainos, and Otto came in from shoveling snow. It was like in January or February or something. And Vivica said, um, oh, Beetle called and wants to know if we want to go you know, buy her house and move to Southern California. And basically, it was a pretty immediate decision to do so. It was, um, this is a, a, a tangent, but traveling with Beatrice in India, I ended up doing my doctorate on, on pottery making in India, but um, I went, I took her to potters, um, to, to Indian village potters. And in, in India, women never touch the wheel. And uh, uh, women sculpt many of the pieces, but they don't touch the wheel. The wheel is considered to be um, uh, so potent uh, that it would damage anybody that, I mean, I, I couldn't touch a wheel either um, a, a, as a non-potter, but um, at any rate, Beatrice potted on potter's wheels. And it was, um, and, and as, who was it that said, I guess it was Lalan that you said, she was so charming, charmed anyone. Uh, uh, and even those thousands of years of history were, were um, sort of swept aside so that Beatrice could work on the wheel. Um, and it was wonderful to watch. You know, she, she was, there was nothing more wonderful than watching Beatrice pot, throw a, throw a pot, it was extraordinary. All right, so we'll just take one more question. Um... I know we, we talked about Krishna Murti. Someone's asking about the influence of theosophy in her life and art. Um, I'll, I'll let everyone else uh, chime in, but I'll make clear that she was a lifelong theosophist from the time she was first introduced to it, which was when Krishna Murti was first being hailed as the world teacher, and she became um, under the influence of Annie Besant. Um, so from that point forward, um, a theosophist, so the impact course was was incredible but I'll uh, I'll turn it over to anybody else who wants to address that well I I went with her to India and we stayed at the Theosophical Center I went with her in in Del I mean in Ojai to the Cortona many times but uh, we stayed at the Theosophical Center she was a you know a lifelong member yeah. there and uh, so that was impressive to say the least um, I, I was so, so young, you know, I was so green. And her friends, um, Rukmini Devi Arendale was one of her major closest friends. Uh, and Rukmini was also uh, one of those that was discovered along with Krishnamurti, with Krishnaji, uh, at the same time and became, according to the theosophists, uh, the, the, would be the, the um, world mother while he was to be the the, in a sense, the Messiah. And uh, both of them renounced that at the same age. They were the same age. Um, uh, but, but you said, the question was uh, theosophy and art. And I can't answer that one. Can you, Francis, or anybody else? No, no. I, I never was able to draw the connection. I still well, I think not... they, were two, they were two separate entities in her life. I don't necessarily think they, um, you know, they coexisted within her her spiritual um, guidance in theosophy 
was her personal belief system, um, which, you know, influenced how she perceived things and created things and the way she interacted with people. But I don't really know if it had a great direct influence on the creation of her artwork. Oh, actually, uh, building upon what Nancy started there, um, the theos in theosophy, you study the world religions and you study all of the wisdom traditions of the entire world. And those of you who have been in Beatrice Wood's library or know about Beatrice Wood's history with art books, she applied those same principles to her study of art, basically the entire world. And, and art before the Renaissance, any art that was created was spiritual in nature. So the spiritual nature of art runs through history. And so even today at the center, we have our library. You can see it. She, it was not that theosophy influenced her work as much as the principles of theosophy and the study of world religions and world traditions ended up being the major influence on her work, if that makes any sense. The only That's conversation I had with her uh, about this really was she made a, I don't know if you even still have this in the archives, she made a chart, uh, which she showed me, of the actual sayings of Jesus, of Muhammad, and of Buddha. And she showed me how they were all, in effect, saying the same things. And along the side, she wrote the parallels with theosophy. So that theosophy was, in fact, all of those religions. It was a beautiful chart. I, I, I wish I made a copy of it. It went on for several pages and she, she showed it to me. And it's all based on her readings of these various religions. So she thought of all of them, like you just said, as one, one giant spiritual jumble. When I, when I, docu when I interviewed Beatrice in the late eighties for her biography, which I've never written, um, she at that point was read, re she is such, she was so well read. She was phenomenal. Oh yeah. Uh, had 80 periodicals that she read um, every month and uh, that she subscribed to, and they were the entire spectrum. It wasn't art. It was art, but it was also philosophy and history and science and, um, and politics from all Everything. different sides. Yeah. But the other thing about Beatrice and what she taught me, which I really try to follow in, in India and my work there, which was, as I said, uh, founded by her, uh, is that and I think this might be a Dada thing too, uh, is that she, that nothing is, is not art. Everything is art. Every, it's all how you look at it. So that um, she, there were such strong definitions of what is and what isn't art or what was fine art and what was folk art, what was craft and what was simply tools that were used. And as far as Beatrice was concerned, as far as I'm concerned, anything that functions is made and has purpose for anyone it is of value. And I have no right to judge that. She taught me that one has no right to judge another person's creativity. Mm. And so uh, certainly there are things that any of us are drawn to more than others and we can have our own personal uh, tastes. And she also taught me discernment, certainly. To go with Beatrice to the shops and galleries of, of of Paris, you know, the, or to any museum, or to galleries and museums in New York or London, as we did, and, and around India, and to see through her eye, her discernment was extraordinary of what she did see. You know, her, her eye was astounding, but in the same breath, she didn't judge. I mean, it's hard to say, you can be discerning, but not judging. It, it wasn't saying that that was wrong but she certainly had things that she could see and appreciate for their beauty um, that others might not see. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, we'll take one more question. I see Jill has her hand up um, and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, I, I'm a little dilatory coming in on this, but uh, everybody was talking, not everybody, but a lot of you were talking about the, um, connection possibly of art related to theosophy and what came to mind is there's a theosophical axiom that is there is no religion higher than truth 
And because of Beatrice's exquisite sense of always telling the truth, and she could say the worst things, and they were like love sonnets. You know, it's just so incredible that I, I just wanted to share that. Thank you so much. All right, so I guess, um, I guess this concludes our evening. Um, oh, let, let, let me just say that we are working on doing some, um, th this was, this is Beto's birthday. We wanted it to be fun and move along, but we are working on getting some of these individuals to do uh, more in depth uh, Zoom interviews. I believe we've gotten uh, Stephen and Hi to agree to do so. Correct? Yes. So <laughs> we're going to do that coming up because, you know, any of these people that have been here tonight to talk for, you know, you'd want to spend an entire day with them. So if we can get these people an hour. Uh, Francis, can we talk you into that? Yeah, of course. Sure. I'll do anything for Beatrice. <laughs> cool. And, and Nancy, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, and I'm hoping Bob can help us with this. We're trying to get in touch with um, Beatrice's other studio assistants and do something there. Good. Okay, back to you, Rachel. Oh, so you. I guess, you know, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, yeah. oh, I, actually, I need to interrupt because I need to thank Rachel. She, she's our current intern at the center. Um, I, you know, some of you are getting older. I'm not getting older, but still, for some reason, it helps to have people that are 20 and 30 somethings that understand technology and understand mm -hmm. how to use a computer. Um, as opposed to Nancy and I sometimes. Um, so I, I and, and, and I have to say, Rachel from the beginning was like, well, you have to get Francis now. Like, okay, you got to get this person, you got to get that person. And I'm like, well, I don't want to like have all these people come in just for 10 minutes on her birthday, but of course it all came together. So thank you so much, Rachel, you made this happen. Oh, thank, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I'll send out a link. Mm -hmm. with I sent an email with li some links to um, like the Beto chocolates and Francis's book and anything else, um, maybe Stephen's book that's coming up. Um, so we'll still be in touch. <laughs>